There we are. Hi, everybody. I'm Ricky Heller from RickyHeller.com, and I'm so excited today to talk to Leanne Vogel of Healthful Pursuit. Leanne and I were just chatting how we've seen each other's names and we've we've communicated so many times um, by email, but we've never actually spoken in person. So this is a very exciting day. So hi, Leanne. Welcome to the Hangout. Hey. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited to be chatting with you. This is going to be great. Great. So as you guys know, who are watching. Um, we're going to be talking about candida, keto, and a vegan diet. And Leanne, you've done all three, I guess, right? <laughs> sure have. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. So let me just say a couple of words about Leanne for those who don't know her. She writes the blog, Healthful Pursuit. And Leanne is a nutritionist, and she's also a health coach and a cookbook author. And she does awesome videos with other authors as well, all kinds of information on her blog through all kinds of diets. And she helps people thrive on a restricted diet um, and I know you use the word liberated a lot so that's great so why don't you tell us a little bit more I'd love for my readers to know, or my readers and my viewers to know your story and how you came to write your blog yeah so I started my blog about four oh, over four years ago now uh, and it really started from a place of I was um, at that point I believe I was a recovering vegan so I was eating a little bit of meat I had been vegan for about seven years and then met my husband who's German who loves meat and I started eating meat um, and and really the reason I started up Healthful Pursuit was because I wanted to live in a world where every woman loved her body and um, where you know That's nourishing good. fats and as that went along it became about nourishing fats and uh, enjoying those at every meal and really that progression of um, being okay with your food allergies and I know Ricky that's something that you touch on too is just you know feeling that uh, feeling of freedom even though we have these restrictive diets you know myself I have always been allergic to dairy I found out that I was sensitive to gluten I found out that I was sensitive to grains and I didn't do well with them and then when you're at this point where you know your body doesn't respond well to things you're kind of at a crossroads to okay am I gonna make that step and all these changes and feel really restricted and gross or am I just gonna ignore it and so for me it was always about okay well what's that third option how do I listen to my body give it what it needs but not have that gross restrictive feeling of I can't go out and do things and um, life is horrible so I started Healthful Pursuit to really show that trend you know document my transition between okay well I was vegan and now I know that that's not resonating with me anymore and I'm gluten free and how do I do all of that and really helping women be okay with having those restrictions and living that liberated life and so over time you know I've been creating YouTube videos I have over 750 recipes on my blog now and a bunch of different programs and stuff to help help us along in in going through that path and as you said I've been vegan I've been um, keto I've done low carb I've done high fat I've done vegan like every everything <laughs> everything under the sun so it's a good progression <laughs> yeah and we will we will talk about a, a lot of those things and yeah I think we, we're very much in line in terms of showing people that it doesn't have to be like a prison sentence on it on a special diet that you can still eat foods like Leanne's recipes you guys oh my god I'm going to talk a little bit about more about those later but um, you can have delicious fantastic food within your dietary boundaries as I like to call them not I, I prefer to use the word restriction these days because I don't think it feels restrictive so okay so um, people know that my main thing is candida because I've been on a candida diet for so long I know you also dealt with candida and that you um, managed to clear it and that you're free from candida now so maybe you could tell us a little bit about how that happened for you what um, maybe what precipitated it and what did you do to get clear of your candida sure totally so I remember uh, when I was a kid I was on a lot of antibiotics a lot all the time um, I was always sick it seemed like I think like any child but I think 
there was a time, and maybe it's still happening, I mean, I'm not a mom, but I do hear this from a lot of my clients, that kids are put on antibiotics all the time. And um, for me, when I became a young adult, I was having a lot of weird symptoms like yeast infections and rashes and things that I just couldn't understand. So I went uh, to my naturopath and she did all these tests and told me that I had candida and it was this huge thing and I had to remove all these foods. And this was the first time I'd really thought about food. Like this was before I studied holistic nutrition. I really didn't understand the concept that food could affect the way that I live or affect my body. Like it just didn't, I couldn't comprehend it. And so she gave me this list of all these foods that I couldn't eat and I followed it for maybe three days and was like, this is not happening. <laughs> and so again, it was that crossroads of, I'm just going to ignore the problem. And so it got worse. And um, then I picked up uh, a couple years later, I think it was after I studied nutrition, I started appreciating the role that Candida had um, and how it was affecting me. And so by removing grains and um, removing dairy and things, I was already on my way to um, healing my candida. The big thing for me was sugar <laughs> and I dealt with a sugar addiction up until probably about the beginning of last year. So it's been about a year or so that I really got serious about my addiction to sugar and not just sugar in the form of like adding sugar to baked goods, I'm talking about fruit. Like fruit for me me and fruit, were, we were like best buddies. And um, so once I was able to really drastically remove the fruit from my eating was the first time that I started seeing uh, progression and positive changes um, with my struggle with candida. And up until that point, I had tried to remove fruit and sugar and things, but as many people know, when you're addicted to sugar, even if you really enjoy the taste of fruit, by just removing it, you kind of want it more. And it wasn't until I started following more of a high fat eating style that I learned that I could replace the fruit with fat and help to uh, mitigate all of those cravings that I had. So wow. it was the first time where I replaced it with something instead of just saying, no, 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 you can't have that. <laughs> so, uh, around May can when I, I can I interrupt yeah. for half a second this is so fascinating and yeah I, I I'm so totally with you on the sugar addiction thing oh my goodness um even still because I still enjoy sweet things but I'm just curious to know so how much fruit do you eat now a big fat zero really so yeah I have never I, no, I think I the last time I ate fruit was probably about four months ago, and I had um, an overripe banana uh, because it's more glucose than fructose, and I thought that that would be okay with a couple of berries. And within about 30 minutes, I got super hyper, and this had been about three months off uh, fruit. I got super hyper, like really, and I was talking really fast, like it, it was very strange. And then I just crashed, like I crashed. I have not experienced that ever. And the next day I felt like I drank three bottles of wine. Like I was completely hungover. And then I just said, you know what? Fruit does not resonate. And I'm, I haven't done a video or anything about this yet, but I definitely plan on doing it. That I, I really don't feel like fruits and vegetables should be fruits and vegetables together. I think vegetables are great and fruit is on its own. And just because nature created it doesn't mean it's healthy. It's sort of like saying, oh, but snake venom is edible. <laughs> because nature made it and it's like no I don't know so well, yeah I mean, fruit. You know, it's, it, what's interesting is of course there are whole diets devoted to fruit only right so every, uh, and, and I think you know for those people that it works for great but I'm kind yeah. of in the same camp as you in terms of fruit I, I, um, I ate I, I, I've brought fruit back but I've never brought back things like bananas or, fi or figs I brought back and I realized I couldn't do it or, or like medjool dates which I used to love but of course they're the fruit with the absolute highest sugar content of all fruits, so of course I love them. And last summer, I realized I need to cut back severely, so I'm back to berries and apple, green apples and pears, and that seems okay for me, but I totally understand. So I think, you know, um, it's very interesting you said that because obviously you replaced it with something, which for you is this whole ketogenic, but I don't know if I let you finish your story about candida, but I also then, maybe you can talk about how if that sort of transitioned at some point to keto, um, people would love to know how that happened and also what that is, what keto is. 
yeah, what the heck is a keto? Oh my gosh, I didn't know. Uh, last year, I had no idea what a keto was. Basically, um, keto is short for ketosis, not to be confused with ketoacidosis, which is a state that diabetics go into that's uh, not a safe place. Uh, keto is a, a state of nutritional ketosis, where your body is burning fat as fuel instead of glucose as fuel. So if you have carbohydrates during the day, you are eating uh, carbs, and those are being converted into glycogen uh, and stored in your muscle for energy. But the ketosis is where you are removing that glucose from your body by eating a low-carb eating style and naturally eating then more fats, uh, not more protein. A lot of people think that this is a high-protein diet. It is not that. Um, and I don't like to use the word diet. I always say eating style. So... Um, and then so by removing those carbohydrates or, or restricting those carbohydrates, then you, um, you start using your body fat and the fats that you eat as your fuel source. And so in May-ish, I was introduced to keto and started it in June, and that's where that transition came into is like, I don't need the fruit because I'm just going to have fat for breakfast. And it slowly... Uh, morphed into there. Um, a lot of my clients lately and even my Facebook group and communities and something that your uh, listeners and watchers and readers might be interested in is that in, in a high state of ketosis where our body is creating what's called ketone bodies and those are created by using uh, fats as energy uh, basically uh, is that ketone bodies in a large amount will actually flare up your candida. So what I'm finding is that people that are in a very, very um, deep state of ketosis where they haven't eaten carbohydrates or their carbohydrate intake is quite low and they're creating a lot of ketone bodies, candida loves the ketone bodies, just like it loves sugar. So it's about creating that healthy balance I've found in that um, you can be in a mild state of ketosis, just like you can have, and I'm sure you can attest to this, just like you can have, um, figure out where your level is, like you're, what you were saying with pears and apples and kind of seeing where that, where you can play within that. But, you know, just like if you were to have a big, huge cake from a conventional um, bakery, it would probably flare up your candida, so would being in a huge state of ketosis. So that's what my journey's been these um, almost a year now is trying to figure out where that balance is. Wow, and you know that is that's so interesting to me because you know I've been on basically a version of the anti diet. Like I'm on what I call maintenance now. So like I said, I reintroduced a whole bunch of foods and I reintroduced flour products, but I really um, try not to have too much of that stuff. So, um, and what is so fascinating is there are periods where I think, okay, I'm going to go back to stage one. Like it, when I when I do, I do this group called the Candida Kickstart, which is um, a group program for people at the beginning stages of the diet. And so yeah. I always go back to stage one when I do that because I want to be on the same playing field as all the people in the course, which means no grains pretty much, very, very low or no grains. And I end up eating a lot, a lot of nut products. And also because coconut oil has that, that uh, antifungal property, yes, a lot of coconut oil. And what I have found is when I feel like I'm eating like too much of that nut butter and nuts and coconut oil, I can have little flares. So it's probably <laughs> exactly what you're talking about. That's just so fascinating. Yeah, so it's really, really important to find that balance because, oh my gosh, I'm seeing this time and time again. If, if, and even I was looking through some of my Candida pro protocol stuff before our, sh before our recording just to make sure um, I was on the right page and everything. <laughs> and what I found is that, yeah, those stage one things, if you go too high fat, you're naturally going to be in a ketone generating state. And if your body, I find some bodies are easily switched into ketosis quite easily. If you're one of those people, you could easily have a flare up and then say, oh, this isn't working for me, but it's just that it's just too much fat and just too much creation. So there's things that you can do to um, lower your ketone generation. So that's not actually a thing. Wow. That's, so actually talking about that, I don't know, you, you didn't, um, if you got to the point where you t tell us exactly what the ketogenic diet is, like how does that look in terms of exactly. the, the amount of fat and that kind of, of stuff that you eat in a day? Totally. So um, for me personally, I find that my sweet spot is about 65% of everything that I eat 
is fat based so those are like the oils and the avocados and stuff and people are normally like even when I say 65 percent I used to do 80 percent when I first started on this it was 80 percent um, and then I've started training and building muscle and so I've reduced a little bit more a, a bit of my fat and increased protein so right now um, a ketogenic eating style is usually anywhere between 65 to 90 percent fat depending on the type of person that you are and where your metabolism is at and such and then carbohydrates are usually around the 10 percent mark um, so to give you an idea, usually on a day where I'm not training, I'm eating about 30 grams of net carbohydrates. So that's total carbs minus fiber. And so if you take the fiber, I usually try to be around 30, 35 uh, grams of fiber. So it works out to be anywhere between like 60 to 70 grams of total carbs, depending on how much fiber that I'm eating. And then the rest is protein. So what would be like a food representation of that much carb? Like what would you get to eat in terms of carb? Just so people get a sense of how much the, the actual food is fat and how much food you get in carbs. Totally. Uh, I focus a lot on uh, greens. So a lot of low carb vegetables. I love kale and celery and zucchini. And so to kind of give you an idea of how my day goes, maybe that's the best way to uh, explain it, is yeah. um, when you become uh, ketogenic, because your body is burning fat as fuel, your body fat is fair game, which is really awesome because it means that you don't have to eat as much. Yeah. And, and just in all those, you know, like I know I used to be one of those people that ate every two to three hours, like on the dot, or I would punch somebody in the mouth. Um, that's not the case anymore. So uh, a normal um, transition to ketosis is to um, have larger meals that are spread out further. So for example, when I wake up in the morning, like I have it right here because I have been busy all morning, but it's a blended uh, drink and today I used hot water with some vanilla powder and some uh, coconut oil and some hemp seeds and so I blended that up and that's what I use in the morning and then for lunch I would have a big bowl of greens um, maybe some protein of some sort usually like half a chicken breast or a chicken thigh or something like that and if you're vegan uh, chickpeas work really well they're a lower carbohydrate a protein almonds hemp seeds those sorts of things um, and then my fats usually I just um, add in my fats like think of what your grandparents used to do like it's not about drowning everything in fat it's just like if you're sauteing something add the fat if you're roasting something add the fat if you have a salad make a really rich dressing so it's not about a lot of the times I say I eat 65 percent fat and people think I take a bottle of olive oil and down it it's not it's not that um, and then for dinner I would have pretty much the same thing um, a bunch of greens, some sort of protein, and then um, just baking and cooking and making sure that there's oils and nuts and things um, in my food. And so um, it's been quite different coming from a girl who used to saute with water because I was afraid of using fats. <laughs> That's amazing. And I know we were talking about this um, earlier. We're, we're different ages. <laughs> but I remember, and you probably wouldn't have any experience with this, but my mom, who was from a previous era, when she would um, roast a chicken, I guess, yeah, we, she roasted chicken or even chicken soup, she would cool it afterwards. And, of course, all the fat congealed. And I can remember as a kid, we had a jar of chicken fat in our fridge. And my yeah. mom used that to make mashed potatoes. And as a kid, I loved those mashed potatoes. And I remember as I got older, like in my teen years, probably when I was first aware of diet and that I was overweight and always, always on a diet, and I tasted it again, and it was just vile to me. Oh, gross, disgusting. And since, even since then, like now, that, that whole um, taste, that whole flavor over the years, as my 20s and 30s, I just hate it. But like people did that. They saved the fat or the bacon grease. You put in a little jar or a little cup, and it goes in the fridge. And they reused it, right? Because I guess that's the whole concept of using the whole animal. But, um, so that's very interesting. But the, the other thing um, that you mentioned that I'd love to follow up on, because as you know, my diet is, like I said, it's, it's, it's often grain-free, and it's usually mostly grain-free. Um, so I'm pretty close. Like in many ways, I'm like a vegan paleo in some ways, although I, of course I have legumes and beans. 
But I know that you also deal with clients who are vegan who want to be on this keto uh, approach. So maybe you could talk a little bit. How would you, you know, how do you adapt that for your vegan food clients? And I'm sure people um, on air would also love to know how do they do on this diet too. Exactly, totally. Um, we're actually hosting a huge vegan event on healthfulpursuit.com uh, for April, where we're going to talk about like vegan and ketosis and how to do this because. Maybe you maybe you're not vegan, but maybe you just don't like eating meat every day, and that's totally fine. The great thing about eating high fat, low carb in a more ketogenic state is that you don't need a lot of protein. So um, when I first got it going, I was eating about 60 grams to 75 grams of protein. As a vegan, that's super attainable. Um, some some things that we work on, you know, when I'm working one-on-one -on -one with clients, being in vegan ketosis, is um, for protein. Like the hemp seeds are great. Almonds are fantastic. Um, in one of the interviews that I did with Joe from includingcake.com on uh, vegan and ketosis, was um, use thinking of your snacks as places to include protein and. Until she said that, I've always th thought, okay, well, like protein at every, you know, big meal. But she was saying, no, like the key to vegan ketosis is making sure that you're having protein in your snacks too. So like hemp seeds and almonds take a big precedence there. If you can do tofu and you want to go the soy route, like the non-GMO tofu, I'm not a big fan of soy, but some people love it. So um, I'll leave that up to my clients and what they want to do. Um, chickpeas are also a, a lower carb. Um, item that's protein and then there's also your high protein vegetables and a lot of people forget about those like broccoli is awesome even cauliflower has quite a bit of protein so um, it's about just switching those ideas and a disclaimer is if you are supposed to be vegan like if your body resonates so well with this eating style and it's exactly where you need to be I find those people can get away with eating more carbohydrates than yeah. people that are not supposed to be vegan. I know that for the last year or so that I was vegan, I would drive past a KFC or anything and I would be like salivating. Like I just needed the meat. Like I knew that my body wasn't um, where it should be and I was just scared to make that transition. So, you know, if your body is meant to be vegan in this space, you'll find that you can eat more carbohydrates and your body can still go into that fat burning mode. Um, and that in that fat burning mode and something that we haven't talked about is the benefit of ketosis and why it works not only for burning your body fat and all the you know outside stuff but things like infertility uh, PCOS your food cravings uh, blood sugar control abnormal cell growth uh, weight you know the weight management piece so there's so much more and brain activity um, you know like my my family has a very strong history of Alzheimer's, which is why I've been so keen on keeping this up, and cancer as well. The fact that it can stop abnormal cell growth, that's a huge thing. So it's so much more than just, let's lose 20 pounds. It's, it's a lifelong strategy. Yeah, and I think that's the key to any of these diets. You have to yes. have them on it for, forever, right? So I, yeah, I think that's so important. Um, that, so interesting and um, I'm glad to hear that people who are on vegan diets can go the ketogenic route. It, it's so, it, what, what also I find so funny is, you know, I'm actually, do you know your blood type? I don't. I'm actually donating blood for the first time on Saturday and I'm so oh, no. excited. <laughs> uh, well, I'm type O, which as if you know about Eat Right for Your Type, I'm supposed to be eating like caribou and venison and all those things and here I am on a plant-based diet and What's weird for me is I do feel like this is the diet I am best at and I'm meant to eat. Yeah. Like totally, like every, like so many other things. This is a total contradiction, but I thought that that was interesting. So, um, and then the, the the I guess the last question for you, and then I'm gonna look. We have we have three questions I think already up there. So um, I, I'm just gonna stop to mention for people who are watching this live, there should be a chat box under the video, and you just need to um, enter your question in there and hit hit enter. And then um, Leanne and I will answer it. So, or, or Leanne or I or both of us will answer it. So, um, you know, we we're talking earlier about sugar addiction and desserts, and so that's my big thing. And your uh, grain-free dessert books, both of them actually, Dessert Freedom and what's the other one called? Christmas. Uh, Christmas Dessert Freedom and Dessert Freedom. Yeah. Or like the, they contain some of my absolute all-time favorite desserts. Oh, thank you. 
Well, as you know, the cocoa caramel bars that you shared on my site still remain one of the most popular uh, recipes on my site. Actually, I'll put the, the link under it once we're done. But um, so clearly, being on keto doesn't necessarily mean you're giving up all your sweet treats. So, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you balance that and how you still manage to get those indulgent feelings and indulgent desserts while you're on a keto diet. Yeah, so stay, uh, I kind of look at the keto diet as stages. The first stage is eliminating a lot of the sugary treats and things like that. And um, in that stage, I find the best thing that I've found that works best for me is full-fat coconut milk because I find it's, it's a little bit sweet and if you add a tiny bit of stevia you can get that same sweet factor um, and sometimes I'll blend that like I'll, I'll chill it and then I'll remove the really really fatty stuff put it like remove as in use it and toss the rest <laughs> put that high fat stuff in a blender with a little bit of um, cacao powder and a drop of stevia and it makes fluffy amazing mousse yeah. And w when I'm craving something, I mean, that does the trick. It's got the fats. Um, my body thinks that it's sweet when it's really not. Um, another one, are you familiar with Giddy Yo-Yo? Oh, I love their stuff. Yeah. Okay, so their Hindu bars are naturally sugar-free. Like, there's no sugar. They don't add sugar to those bars at all. It's just ah. straight up cacao paste and just, like, brilliantly delicious chocolate. And when I need that sweet hit... Oh my god, the chocolate, and sometimes I'll just take a drop of little stevia and swirl it around on the little bar <laughs> and eat it. And so those are the sorts of things that I did up front. I also have on my blog flaxseed muffins, and um, it's basically just like flax and water. You don't have to use eggs. You can use flax eggs or chia eggs. So I use those, add a little bit of cinnamon, coconut oil, and that, that helps. And then stage two, and something that I'm working with now, is more of a carb up. So for women, and I'm sure a lot of the people listening right now are women, our hormones need a certain amount of carbohydrates, and our bodies, a lot of us need a certain amount of carbohydrates. So now... Uh, my community is playing around with, okay, well, let's be fat burners in the morning, but let's boost our carbs in the evening so that we can maintain uh, a good level of hormones and actually bust through plateaus and things like that and give our bodies what we need. And so by doing those carb ups, we get to have things that maybe are a little bit sweeter, like sometimes... Um, I'll have like a sweet potato with some cinnamon on it, which is more carbohydrates. I've played around with a little bit of maple syrup because it do it doesn't have as much fructose as things like coconut sugar um, or honey would. And I find um, having a history of candida, any of those fructose-based sweeteners just knock me out. Like oh. I just I can't even handle it. So I find I respond better to the maple syrups, which are more. Um, glucose burning than the fructose. So there's a bunch of different ways to play around with it. Um, but I found too in eating more high fat, like I was the dessert girl. Like yeah. I love desserts, but I just, and it's so funny even coming out of my mouth, I'm like, what? But I just, I don't need them. Like it's so strange. Yeah. I just don't require a lot of desserts anymore. Maybe I'll have one every couple of weeks and I'm not even fibbing when I say that. It sounds crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm sort of the same. Like I, I'm, not, I'm not quite once every couple of weeks, but I used to be the kind of person who would eat desserts for a snack, right? Like I would have sweets as a snack. And yes. now having been on this diet for so long, and, and I think it's also, like you were saying, it's the kind of desserts. Like, it, you know, I'll, we, my husband and I, he loves anything creamy and smooth. So, I do a lot of ice creams as our desserts, but they're my anti-candida ice creams. And one of the ones that's like our favorite is called, uh, it's, uh, it's on my blog called Caramel Ice Cream, but it's basically coconut milk and then a secret ingredient. You'll have to go look on my blog to see it, Caramel Ice Cream. But I'll do that and I'll do like a raw cacao um, chocolate chip or something like that in it. And that totally will hold me for days. Like that's all I want or need. And I even find, you know, because I, my big thing used to be cake. It's frosting, like cake, like oh, cake. yeah. I know, I know. But even when I do that kind of thing now, if it's within the boundaries of my ingredients that are, that are safe for me, it doesn't have the same pull. It just doesn't, I'm not compelled to go back and eat more and more and more the way I used to. 
So yes. it's, it's surprising and lovely, I have to say. Yeah, because for me also, I, I'm the kind of person I thought I would never in my whole life say, one dessert is enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> Slap. <laughs> What's wrong with you, woman? <laughs> <laughs> so there is hope, everybody. It can happen. It can, even if it can happen to us, it can happen to you. Oh, yes. <laughs> like, I was the girl who went to Costco to get those big bags of jujubes, like the big Costco bags. <laughs> and I would sit in front of the TV and just, like, eat all of the jujubes. Yeah, been there, been there. Like, <laughs> so this has just been so interesting, and I, I it, you know, maybe I'll give you a second to think if there's anything else you want to talk about before we get to the questions. But um, or no, sorry, I mean after the questions. But I see we have a couple here, so I'm just going to read. Let's the do it. It says, I notice you have flaxseed muffins often with your meals. Is that to help with fiber intake slash constipation issues? If someone is having a constipation issue on the keto diet, any recommendations? So. Um, the flax muffins and the constipation. Yeah, okay, so the reason I include the flax muffins is A, they taste amazing, <laughs> and I'm a little bit addicted to the amazingness. Uh, B, yeah, definitely, it's a fiber because um, I can't remember the statistic, but for every gram of fiber that you include in your eating style or like in your meal, it reduces the amount of effective calories or effective energy in that meal. So the more fiber that you eat, the less your body has to process. So it's pretty interesting. So I try to include as much fiber as I can in every meal and only eating twice a day, you know, those those meals twice a day. You want to make sure that there's enough fiber in there just for you know blood sugar regularity too if you've ever had something that doesn't have a lot of fiber um, your insulin spikes and you don't feel so hot um, and while we can use insulin to work in our favor we're not even going to get to that today um, but uh, so for the flax muffins definitely I use it for fiber um, it's a great you know if I haven't had enough fat I'll slather a bunch of if I'm playing around with butter that day I'll add butter or coconut oil it's a great way to get up my fats and if you are constipated on this eating style, chances are you're probably not having enough magnesium. I find that that's always a good place to start. In my book, The Keto Beginning, I talk extensively about the importance of magnesium on this eating style. And really overall, like even if you chat with people that aren't doing keto, like magnesium is a huge, huge problem for a lot of people. And so I take Natural Calm. It's a powdered magnesium supplement. I do it every night before bed. Um, I'm up to about two, te two teaspoons now. And I find that that it works magic. Um, and, and greens too. A lot of people, um, when they go on this keto eating style, a lot of the resources out there are really high in dairy, really high in processed foods. Like it's crazy and so getting back to the magnesium rich foods like your almonds your greens like green 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 it up <laughs> and so it's just about finding that balance and a lot of water like and I also talk about the keto lemonade in my book um, where you're combining ingredients to help with your electrolytes which also helps with constipation and regularity so I hope that answers your question yeah, that's a great answer. And I'm just going to say also, like people who are on an anti-candida diet, this is an issue there too. And magnesium, okay. I still take magnesium. And the thing that I found so interesting, because that's been my issue over the years on and off, when I was at the Hippocrates Health Institute last year at this time, oh, I miss it, it's in Florida, I'm so warm, and it's freezing here now, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, you know, there, theirs is a raw vegan diet with two green juices a day. So you get loads of green. You get green juice. You get wheatgrass juice, which is green, and more magnesium. And so you're constantly um, having magnesium-rich food. And I wasn't taking magnesium, but yet I I had complete regularity there. So yeah, to get it's magnesium. Uh, nutritionist likes to talk about poop people, so just so oh you know. yeah, poo talk. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, so important. Um, and then we have one more, which I'll just I'm looking up because I'm looking at my other computer, everybody, and it's at my standing desk, so that's why I'm looking up. Is it necessary to calculate your macros? Oh, awesome question. Uh, okay, it depends what type of person you are. Um, if if this is a new eating style for you, for the first, maybe just tell tell everybody else what that means. What? Do oh yeah, a macro. Okay, so a macro is a macronutrient. So you have your fats, your proteins, and your carbohydrates. And so at the beginning of our video, we were talking about you know I eat 65% fat around 10% percent 
carbohydrates, and the rest protein. And so those are your macros. And when you're first starting off in this eating style, if you want to get into ketosis, like if that is your goal, you want to see how you feel, um, in my guide, The Keto Beginning, I guide people through on how to do that. But basically, um, if you're starting anything new, especially with this, uh, it's, it's nice to track your macros just so you know what it looks like. But you don't have to do it. I always say this to my clients. Once you get the hang of it, drop the tracking. See how you respond just by following your instincts. Once you know what it feels like, it's so much easier to recreate it every day. And then every 10 days, track a day. See where you're at. Maybe your eyes got a lot bigger and your fat's gone up and your protein's gone down and so it's a recalibration. So, uh, you know, unless you're the type with my, with my training program now and going on to this next stage of how do we build muscle with ketosis and how does it work with hormones and carving up and all of these things, I've started tracking again to see, okay, like, what does 25% protein look like? Because that's a lot more than I was eating before. And how do I stay into ketosis? So anytime I find that you're making a change with your eating style, it's nice to see where you're at. You know, capture it and then know what it feels like. Play around and do those recalibrations every 10 days to just kind of see where you're where you're landing. But it's not necessary to track it every single day and live by the fitness pal. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's great to know because... I know for me personally, that kind of intensive tracking would would be a deterrent over time. Like yeah. I, I never used to like to count points or calories or anything like that. Um, so man, this has just been so informative and so interesting and so much fun talking to you. Um, well, uh, I think we're that we don't have other questions. So um, I just want to thank you so much. Can you tell everybody how they can get in touch with you on your blog, social media? What else um, in terms of keto if they wanted to work with you? What how people can find out more? Sure, yeah. So the best place to go is healthfulpursuit.com and below this little video there's my URL right there. And um, there you can find my videos. I'm also on YouTube under Healthful Pursuit. So there's tons of stuff on what to expect when you go high fat and how to go high fat and all those things. And then uh, I also have a book, and I've mentioned it a couple times, The Keto Beginning. And it's a complete guide to living this way at, with a 30-day meal plan as kind of a bonus to pick and choose from what you want and kind of see what fits you. And then I also offer a keto one-on-one -on -one coaching where we sit down and hash it out and figure what's your sort of keto because everyone's a little bit different depending on where they're at and, and how that eating style fits for you because I'm of the firm belief that one size does not fit all. Just like we look different on the outside, we all work a little bit differently on the inside. So it's really about you know taking the broad scope of high fat, low carb and making it fit for you, your lifestyle and, and how you approach um, your nutrition. So. All yeah. of that is on healthfulpursuit.com. And I, I totally agree with you. I, I, I think we, it, your diet has to be individualized to you. Yes. And you're also on Healthful Pursuit on uh, Facebook and uh, and all of these. Facebook, stuff. Twitter, Instagram. Um, on Twitter, I'm B underscore healthful. Um, but yeah, Healthful Pursuit on Instagram. And I share a lot of photos of what I'm eating and what I'm up to on there too. Yeah, I follow you on Instagram. I'm to watch, so. Thank you so much, Leanne. It's been such a pleasure talking to you, and I hope everybody that you found this as informative as I did, and we hope to talk to you again. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.